Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Hope everyone's doing okay. Uh, I sent an email kind of summarizing what we got left with respect to how many weeks. And uh, I got one, two, three, four, five, six. What, what, is that right? One, two, three, four, five, and six. Yes, and including that's including the final week. And so I kind of laid out our plan for the rest of the semester. And so today I'm going to do chapter 14. That may take up, uh, that may take up, uh, oh, thank you, Trevor. <laughs> Same to you. Yeah. Um, as I was stating, we're going to, we're going to do that. We got three, we got chapter 14, 15, and 16. So I'm going to do a chapter for the next four Fridays that we meet here. The thought, the rest of the time will be open up to your questions. And that's a good time now to, you know, start preparing for the final coming up and coming in with questions. If you don't have any and you're comfortable where you're at, then, you know, you know, we can go ahead and shut her down. So, but uh, chapter 14 might take quite a bit of that this time today. And then 15 is extremely short as is 16, okay? And so uh, today is the 12th, uh, we'll do 14. Next Friday, the 19th, we'll do chapter 15. Then the following week, the 26th is Thanksgiving break. So we're off and we come back in December the 3rd, we'll finish up chapter 16, we're, we'll finish that up. And then uh, the tent, uh, we should be done with everything. So that day is basically open for you for whatever you need. I will be here. Um, no one shows up, you know, half an hour into it. I, you know, I'll say I'm assuming that you're that uh, you're okay, and I'll, I'll shut her down. Uh, otherwise, if you're going to be late, send me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll hang around. So th this is your time. This is your I call it study day. Whether you bring in questions or you, you know, work on your own, totally up to you, okay? And then our final is scheduled for the 17th. Now, at that time, everything is due, okay? That's the last day you can turn anything in. So, obviously, exams, we can't make those up, um, you know, unless I had pre, we make a range beforehand, but um, those questions, if you miss an exam, I will, as per the syllabus, replace that missing exam with your score of your final, okay? FYI. And I've already made some notes to that effect for the ones that did miss one of the exams, okay? We do have the last exam, number five, that's on the 11th, that's the week before the final. Um, let's see. So, but the, 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 um, the labs, uh, the homework, those guys are still open. You know, yes, they're going to have a late penalty. And so, but getting those done um, is, you know, getting some points is better than getting zero points, okay? So make sure you, you catch up with what you're going to do. And uh, because after that, I, I get everything shake because the semester ends, you know. Officially it ends at 16, but we're, in a, we're a Friday class. And for some reason, they don't include us in the final official day. But for us, officially, it's the 17th. I got to get everything tallied up and get the grades sent in. I, I tend to do that. Uh, give me a day or so to tally everything up and verify it. And I'll probably get everything in by the 19th, the 20th for sure, with respect to the final grades. Okay. If you are considering wanting to withdraw, I can do that from my end, but only if, you know, I can, I can't withdraw you if you've taken the final exam, okay? So, and uh, if you, that's your request, um, think of it carefully because if you have financial aid or any type of support, that could affect, if a withdrawal can affect you with respect to financial aid, you may end up having to pay that back and I don't want to get you into uh, that situation. So uh, it might be best to just take the grade or whatever you earn and then you know, retake it again. Okay, so give us some thought. If you have any questions, shoot me an email about that. All right. Um, 
Any any questions from anybody? Feel free to bring it up. And uh, if not, I will begin with chapter 14. Uh, no questions? All right. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's jump into it. Now, this particular chapter called Intermolecular Forces, you know, inter, I-N-T-E-R, as compared to intra, I-N-T-R-A, slightly different type of effects, okay? The intermolecular forces deal with forces of molecules interacting with other molecules, hence the I-N-T-E-R, you're interacting with other molecules. <laughs> As compared to intra, which that those of that th those forces deal with the with the bonds of the molecule, okay, and so we're kind of kind of trying to put everything together here since we started, you know, and just to rehash, you know, again we started with the uh, basic elements from the elements we created the uh, for ionic compounds we we talked about ionic compounds versus uh, covalent compounds and what's the difference and then the elements became ions when we're dealing with ionic compounds and we started to uh, learn how what kind of charge they have so we can put them together to make a formula for a particular compound and then we started reacting these compounds with each other and we ended up talking about the different reactions that are occurring and uh, we talked about balancing them and so forth so now we're kind of going to have to go back a little bit and refresh your memory with respect to molecules that are polar and nonpolar. And a lot of times you may have to go back to what we did with the Lewis dot structures, if you recall that. We went to the, we were given a formula and uh, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I was reading one of the uh, chats. <laughs> and so now <clears throat> we learned about ionic compounds versus covalent compounds. We learned that within the covalent compounds, now with respect to ionic compounds, we got to deal, we, we're just dealing with metal and non-metal, okay? And when we deal with ionic compounds, we're generally talking about aqueous systems, okay? These intramolecular forces, the majority of these forces, there's only four of them, deal with the covalent compounds. There's four of them. Three of them deal with the covalent compounds, and only one deals with the ionic compounds. And so we can very quickly um, discern that and, and define that we know it's an ionic compound. Therefore, it, these the intramolecular forces would not pertain to ionic compounds. There would be only one intramolecular force. The other three, we have to refresh our memory and how we determine whether a molecule was polar or nonpolar. Recall that we have covalent compounds. That is a combination of nonmetals. And within that domain of covalent compounds, we had two subgroups. We had a polar and a nonpolar. Well, the nonpolar basically, if you recall, is uh, one, or two, one or two things. One, what was bonded, when it was bonded to each other, like diatomic molecules, okay? There, it, that was related to electronegativity. So I gave a generic formula and we got A bonded to A. Now with respect to electronegativity, remember electronegativity? That is a measure of the affinity of an atom to, of electrons to pull onto themselves in a bonded system, okay? Unlike the ionization energy that had nothing to do with any molecules ever bonded. And so here in this scenario, we've got A and A, and this is a very quick way to determine whether you've got a polar or nonpolar molecule. The two elements here are the same. Therefore, the electronegativity is the same. Therefore, there's an equal sharing of that particular bond that they're doing, having with each other. They're sharing, there's equal pull. So it becomes a nonpolar molecule because they all have 
equals sharing, okay? Now we threw in another example that we thought that may on the surface think, well, maybe it's polar, but it's not. Any carbon hydrogen bond, the electronegativity between carbon and hard hydrogen are essentially the same that the net effect is nothing. It is treated like one of the diatomic molecules. Okay, so all of the diatomic molecules are nonpolar, okay? Because the two elements bonded together are sharing equally. And then coupled on that, every carbon hydrogen bond is considered a nonpolar bond. So if that molecule has nothing but carbon hydrogen bonds or it's diatomic, it has, it is a nonpolar molecule. Why is that important? We need to know that because now we can define one of these three intramolecular forces, okay? Because only nonpolar molecules have one type of intramolecular forces, okay? Now, and that is nonpolar non molecules. Now, when we get to polar molecules, I like to denote that as A and B. And what I do that, oh, let, oh let, before I begin, before I go further, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want to forget this part. I just mentioned to you that when they're diatomic or it's a carbon, all carbon hydrogen bonds, you end up with a nonpolar species. The other scenario was this. There are examples that we talked about where you have polar bonds, but because of the configuration of that molecule, the polar bonds cancel each other out, resulting in a nonpolar molecule. And we learned that by the Lewis dot structures and how we created and determined the structure. If you recall, we did carbon dioxide and we ended up with carbon dioxide with two double bonds on two different oxygens. And we had lone pairs on the oxygens denoted as follows. Now, carbon and oxygen are two different elements. Therefore, we have a polar bond automatically. It's not carbon hydrogen, but they're two different other than carbon hydrogen, two different elements. Automatically that tells you, I got a polar bond. Well, I got a polar bond going to the right direction. Recall we had that, that arrow, the dipole arrow, that we know that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Therefore, the electron density is pulled onto the oxygens much more than the carbon, okay? And so we ended up with a partial positive on the carbon side and a partial negative on the oxygen side. And that is going to the right direction. We also have the same scenario going to the left direction, okay? Where we have a partial positive on the right, partial negative on the left of the, toward the oxygens, okay? The, the fact that they are in opposite direction, okay? In opposite direction means that the polar, bond, polar bonds cancel. And when that occurs, we end up with a nonpolar molecule. Now we know what kind of molecule this is. We can assign an intramolecular force to it, okay? All right, so that is why no, if you don't know whether the molecule is polar or not, then you need to figure out the Lewis dot structure and look at the polarity of the bonds. We did an example very similar to this one. It was tetrahedral, and let's just put fluorides in there. We have four carbon fluoride bonds and we ended up with a tetrahedral species, okay? Tetrahedral. Well, we got four polar bonds, but because of the, the symmetry and the geometry of the tetrahedral position, all four polar bonds cancel out. So this species, carbon tetrafluoride, is nonpolar overall. And we wouldn't know that unless we did the Lewis dot structure and see what kind of general formula it generates and then tells us what the geometry is, okay? And so we have a nonpolar species, which means that carbon dioxide and CF4, or anything like CF4 that has polar bonds that are all the same and they all cancel out, we can assign to them a specific intramolecular force, okay? 
So that part, learning what we're going to do as far as what force we give them, we have to know the polarity of the molecule. Not only, not only the polarity of the bonds, but the polarity of the molecule overall. Okay. When we end up with a polar bond, the generic formula is AB. Why? Because we've got two different elements, totally different elements, automatically different electronegativity, they're, and they're uh, I, uh, covalent bond. Automatically, we got a polar bond, okay? No question about it. Depending which direction depends on the electronegativity of A versus B to draw that, that uh, dipolar arrow. And whichever A or B is closer to fluoride, we call that fluoride is the most elect electronegative element. That tells us which one A or B is more electronegative. And let's just say for argument's sake that B is closer to fluoride than A, which means that the uh, B is a lot more electronegative, which means that the electron density is pulled toward B, which tells us that we get a partial negative on B and a partial positive on, uh, on A, okay? This is a permanent dipole, okay? This is a dipole. Think about this, di, two, pole, positive and negative, okay? In this case, partial negative, that's, that's okay. It's still positive and negative. It's a permanent dipole, just like a magnet has a permanent dipole. The earth has a permanent dipole has a positive north and a south, okay? So this is by nature of the bees, a, a polar molecule. Now, if the polar bonds do not cancel out, you end up with a polar molecule, okay? And if you recall, like I just talked about, we did have carbon dioxide with polar bonds, but we also did sulfur dioxide. And because of the lone pair in the sulfur, it kind of causes angle to, to uh, uh, crush in less than this less than 120 degrees. But the result is we have a dipole going in that direction and a dipole going in this direction. They do not cancel out. Therefore, we have a polar species. Okay. And now that we have a, we can define the polarity of the molecule, then now we can be assigned to it one of the, one of the electro, uh, um, intermolecular forces, okay? So, <laughs> refresh your memory on how to determine whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar, okay? Because we're gonna be dealing with intermolecular forces and specifically, this has an effect on the properties of the solution. For example, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, whereas ethanol or drinking, drinking uh, alcohol, ethanol, the, the, the correct name for it, ethanol, they both have shared, they're both polar species, but because of the nature of the beast and how the polarity is in the structure, what results is water has a boiling point at 100 degrees and ethanol has a boiling point, I believe somewhere about 78 degrees, quite different. Another example, you're familiar with nail polish remover. That's nothing more than acetone, some other things, but the majority, one of the majority ingredients is acetone, but it's very volatile. You open up the cap and you can actually feel it evaporate and ether is another one. Okay. Well, because the nature of the polarity molecules and the type of bond they have and the type of molecule they are, there's a, a type of intermolecular force that they have. And some of these forces are very strong and some of them are very weak. So we can just deduce that if we compare ethanol with water just by the basis of the boiling point, like I said, 100 degrees for water, 78 degrees for ethanol, that suggests that the intermolecular forces for alcohol is much less than the intermolecular forces for water. And that's and it, we, we can deduce that simply because of the boiling point. And because those forces that cause an attraction to each other are much less for the ethanol as compared to water. And so 
we are looking at these interactions denoted by this diagram here in that we have this interaction denoted by the dotted line is a force, okay? Because we have a dipole here. We have a dipole in this molecule of some sort, either permanent or temporary. We're gonna talk about that in a second. And so this attraction that I denoted by the arrow can be very strong and very weak. Now, they won't be as strong as a bond, a, a chemical bond, but they're gonna, ne nevertheless, they're, they're relative to each other, they have some, some strength, you know? Water, for example, boils at 100 degrees. When you're boiling water and you're, you've got that temperature up and you get water boiling, all that energy that you put into the system is being used to break up that interaction. And it takes, you know, up to 100 degrees to get up to 100 degrees for these water molecules to have enough energy to separate from each other and go into the vapor phase. Okay. All right. And now, as compared, as I mentioned earlier, intramolecular forces, we need to distinguish the two. Okay. When we, when we talk about this, and, and we do that by reading the question carefully and deciphering the question is the question asking me about how molecules are acting with each other, or they're asking me about how the atoms of the molecule are being held together. See, there's, there's quite a bit of difference. And if they're asking me about how the atoms themselves are holding, are being held together, then we're talking about the type of chemical bonds. And that would be like intramolecular force. That'd be a type of chemical bond being, being ionic bond, being a covalent polar bond or covalent nonpolar bond, okay? And then the intramolecular forces, as I we just discussed, is the breaking up this interaction that occurs between molecules. Okay, so, all right. And we're gonna be able to um, do some relative comparison. We can be, we're gonna hope to be in a position that we can, we can be given the formula for two different compounds. And with that, determine the type of uh, polarity that molecule has. Once we determine that, then we can assign an intramolecular force and then once we assign an intramolecular force, we know you be you know which one's the strongest, which is the weakest. So we can do things like okay, comparing x versus y. Okay, uh, which one will have a higher boiling point? Which one will have a higher melting point? It's the temperature in which it begins to melt if it's a solid. Which one will have surface tension? Higher surface tension which one will have, say, a higher uh, vapor pressure, okay? And we'll get into that. I, I'm saying higher, but you can reverse and say lower, too. You go the other direction. All right. So as we just talked about intra versus inter, I think this, this again, uh, uh, repeats what we just talked about in the previous slide the bonds versus the forces or molecules interacting with each other. Okay, now there are four types of intermolecular forces, four types. The first one is called the London dispersion forces. And this is an easy one to design to because anything that is nonpolar, okay, any nonpolar species, the diatomics I just talked about, any carbon hydrogen bonds, all of them, you know, if they, you got a molecule like a hydrocarbon that's nonpolar, any polar bonds that cancel each other out, all those exa uh, examples, the net polarity of the molecule is nonpolar. When that occurs, the only force they have is number one here, London dispersion forces, which by the way is the weakest of the three that we're gonna talk about, the weakest. The next one is called a dipole-dipole force, okay? Well, to assign this force to them, it has to be a polar molecule, okay? Now, polar molecules have two forces that we can assign to. 
Again, nonpolar molecules, only one, London dispersion forces. But dipole-dipole interactions or uh, forces, they, they require to be a polar molecule. Now, there is, there are, is a special force that is called the hydrogen bridging force. Okay, in order to be assigned to that, yes, you have to have a polar species, polar molecule, just like number two, okay? However, this is a dipole-dipole interaction, but it's a special dipole interaction. And it's stronger than the, than the regular dipole-dipole force, okay? And we call it hydrogen bridging force because obviously we've got hydrogen involved here. And more specifically, we have an, only those compounds that have a hydrogen bonded to nitrogen or a hydrogen bonded to oxygen or a hydrogen bonded to chloride, okay? Only, only these guys. Yes, that's a dipole bond, HN, it's dipole, HO, it is a dipole, HF, it is a dipole bond, okay? But it's a special dipole bond because of the hydrogen bond and in the interactions that are occurring because of this, because of this force, we give it a special name and it's called hydrogen bridging. You may see old literature, old literature that causes it, cause it, cause it, I'm having a tongue twister here. <laughs> they call it or assign the name hydrogen bonding, okay? We, we try to stay away from this nomenclature naming of this force uh, because it infers that it is a true bond where it's being shared and that's not the case, okay? So they're, they're trying to stay away from hydrogen bonding, but it's still in the literature and you may hear it that way. So hydrogen bridging, AKA hydrogen, AKA hydrogen bonding is that interaction, that dipole interaction that only occurs when you have the situation of hydrogen bonded to nitrogen or oxygen or fluoride, only a special case. Okay. And then finally, the fourth one, which we call, it is called ion dipole force. Well, here's the deal. The fact that they use the word ion in there tells you it has to be an ionic compound. Okay, and then the fact that they throw in dipole, what they're generally talking about is aqueous systems, because aqueous systems have a dipole, very serious dipole, in fact, the hydrogen bridging. And so 99% of the time, you're dealing with ions in solution, okay? So when you have that scenario, one, two, and three have nothing to do with it, okay? So they may say something, what, what is, what is the force of sodium chloride in an aqueous solution of sodium chloride? Okay, well, it's sodium chloride, ionic compound. Aqueous solution, water has a dipole. Therefore, the only force involved is number four, okay? All right, now with respect to strength, the force, the strength of that interaction, hydrogen bridging has number one. That is, a, of the three, we can't compare four because it's a totally different system, really. But within the covalent compounds, number three is the strongest of these three. The weakest is number is uh, London dispersion force. And then the dipole-dipole is somewhere in between, okay? And so here's what, here's what I meant earlier about assigning that force. And so if you have two molecules, and you determine that one of them has hydrogen bridging forces involved and the other one has London dispersion forces. Well, you know now that the London dispersion forces are weak. That means that the interaction between molecules is weaker compared to the hydrogen bridging force. And so it would take less energy for any London dispersion force to be breaking apart, okay, as compared to hydrogen bridging force. Now keep that in mind because that will help you to determine answer questions like who's got the higher boiling point? Well, who's got the, the higher surface tension? Who's got the uh, uh, um, viscosity? Viscosity is, the, uh, is how thick it is and how, you know, water, think about this. We know that you, if you had a cup of water and a cup of honey, right? And we did the good old fashioned, you know, 
run for its money, sort of who's going to win the race as we empty the cups. Obviously, the water is right. The water is going to flow out quicker. Honey is going to drip, drip, drip until it finally gets out of the cup. That infers what? That infers that with respect to intermolecular forces, the honey molecules are stronger than the water molecules because the honey molecules are holding on to each other much stronger than the water molecules and therefore it flows much slower than water does. And you know, you might think, well, what, what can we do to make the honey flow faster? Well, the obvious thing would be to heat it up, right? And what are you doing when you heat it up? You break up those intermolecular forces and the honey flows even, even, uh, even quicker, okay? And that's true for melting. You stick a, a piece of a butter in the pan, you know, it's hard as a rock almost when you stick it on the refrigerator, but as soon as you stick it on the pan, what does it do? It melts, because that energy is used to break up that interaction. And most margarines and butters are, are, are nonpolar, and so these London forces are you know, pretty weak to break up, okay? All right, so with all that being said, as <laughs> they say, this, let's talk about specifics forces, okay? So the first one, dispersion forces. Well, the first thing about this is these type of forces, first of all, we come from nonpolar molecules. Every nonpolar, any compound that is classified as nonpolar, the only force they have are London dispersion forces, okay? And they tend to be temporary. They're not very, uh, they're not very strong, and okay? not very strong, and they tend to be temporary. Well, how's that? Well, here's the thing. We all know, or maybe you have at one time taken a balloon and rubbed it on your head, right? And what'd you do with it? You took it and you put it on your chest. It stuck there for a little, a brief time, did it not? Okay. So you might ask, well, what did I do? Well, what you did was your hair like everything else around us is all on the surface loaded with electrons. You know, don't believe me, walk with shoes or no shoes on the carpet, on a thick carpet and drag your feet and then touch something that's metal, okay? You get zapped, right? Those are electrons you picked up, all right? You have a bad hair day, your hair's doing, doing this stuff, okay? Electrons again, or your clothes are clinging to you. Again, it's a, a function of electrons on there. Well, when you rub that balloon, you have transferred those electrons on your hair onto the surface of the balloon. So now your balloon is, has a, 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 a lot more electron density than it did before. As you bring that balloon with electrons close to your chest, remember that on the surface of your chest, any place in your body, you have electrons. And, and when you bring these negative charge electrons of the balloon closer to the uh, chest, it pushes those electrons on the surface away, resulting in a more positive area on your chest. So now you got a more positive area on your chest, you got a high, ne well, the negative area on the balloon, it sticks and the balloon sticks on there. And as you know, it's not going to stick there all day. Eventually, with time, it will disperse. And even by grabbing a balloon, it just pulls away very readily because those forces are, are fairly weak. Okay, so these are temporary uh, dipoles. Okay, as compared to a dipole bond, where you got a permanent dipole. When it comes to nonpolar molecules, it is a temporary dipole. And this kind of diagram kind of shows you what's going on here. Uh, the electrons, you know, as they get closer from here, you push the electrons away, leaving you kind of a partial positive over here, and then you already have a partial negative. So they end up attracting each other, okay? And there's an interaction occurring there. Not permanent, okay? Because these are nonpolar. And there's no dipole here, but those electrons can be moved around a little bit, resulting in a temporary uh, dipole, which results in a, an in an attraction. And if you think about it, if the nonpolar molecule is bigger, 
there's more electrons to create more temporary dipoles, then you got a stronger London dispersion force. And so to compare nonpolar molecules within themselves, yeah, the one that is bigger in size will have a stronger nonpolar, a stronger London dispersion forces than the smaller one, simply because there's more electrons in the bigger one. Okay. All right. So with respect to dipole dipole forces, that exists all it, it, it exists between polar molecules. Okay, and so you can see here we have hydrochloric acid, HCl, and depicted here in models that because of the nature of the beast, we had a partial positive and a partial negative area. There's going to be interaction here with another molecule of HCl. And this shows you two dimensionally, but think of it with three dimensional. We live in a three dimensional world, so it's not only happening along the uh, 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 x axis but along the z, the z and the y okay so there's a lot of forces occurring all right so and and uh again they these can line up so we got another hydrogen here and the chloride and the whole thing continues okay these forces can be fairly strong but this is a dipole dipole force now, with respect to uh, what the requirements are, is this? Well, first of all, it's stronger than London forces. And one of the requirements to have a dipole, dipole, as I stated, it must be a polar molecule, okay? Gotta have that. With respect to hydrogen bridging force, okay? They gotta be polar, no question. There's gotta be a dipole. And there's always a dipole between hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and Oxygen, and especially with fluoride and, and hydrogen, okay? And so this is a special dipole that's stronger than the dipole-dipole force, and we call it hydrogen bridging, but it only occurs with, as I stated before, with hydrogen bonded to fluoride, oxygen, or nitrogen. So I've got NOF, not on file, help you out. Not on file. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluoride, and hydrogen bonded to that. You can see here this interaction, strong interaction that's occurring, strong force that occurs there, okay? And it's occurring, you know, three-dimensionally. If you look at the molecules, the, the picture on the right-hand side, very strong. All right. Uh, with respect to strength, as I stated, London forces are weaker, then comes a dipole, but these guys are a lot stronger. The hydrogen bridge is a lot stronger than dipole, dipole, or London forces, but much weaker than a true bond, a covalent bond or an ionic bond, okay? Not even uh, near as far as magnitude. All right, now with respect to ion dipole, one of the requirements is obviously you gotta have an ion. And so we're talking about ionic compounds, okay? That's criteria number one. And normally the dipole-dipole deals with water, okay? So you can see here we got sodium in the middle and it's being hydrated all the way around, surrounded by water molecules because there is a big dipole in the water molecule, for example. And there's a big old partial negative, actually two partial negatives in the water molecule. And there's an interaction there where the water molecules are stabilizing that ion. Now, the other end of the spectrum, we have the chloride. If this was chloride, for example, which you're gonna use that, but it could be any sodium ion, you know, the counter ion would also be solvated on the other side from the partial positive, okay? Three dimensionally. So that occurs only between a ionic compound and an aqueous system, okay? so. Um, so if the question is asked about finding forces, you can read the question carefully. If they're talking about ionic compounds and aqueous systems, then that's the only force they have, ion dipole force. Okay, so let's kind of summarize fairly, kind of summarize everything with respect to bonds, okay? 
We have an ionic bond, which I hope by now you're well versed with. We have it, that's a combination of a metal and a non-metal. A polar covalent bond, that is a combination of non-metals. And you're gonna have, the, in this case for a polar covalent bond, you have unequal sharing because one of the atoms is a lot more electronegative than the other. With respect to non-polar covalent bonds, you have an equal sharing of that particular bond between the two elements that happen to be basically the same, okay? Like diatomy or a carbon hydrogen example, okay? So there's a difference between the bonds as compared to forces. With the forces, we get the London force. Criteria for that, non-polar, okay? We have the dipole-dipole force. Its criteria is you gotta have a polar molecule, okay? And the hydrogen breaking force, its criteria is yes, you gotta have a, you, have, you need a polar molecule, but moreover, it only pertains to hydrogen that is bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluoride. If you don't have that scenario, then it falls back to dipole-dipole. Okay. Then finally, you have the uh, ion dipole forces. This is deals with ions in polar molecules. And nine times out of 10, it's, it's water that you're dealing with. Okay. So you may have a table like this and you say, okay, column, num uh, column number one, you need to assign to it whether it's polar or non-polar. Okay. And then once we know that, then we can assign to it what is the strongest intermolecular force it has. All right. So for some of these cases, you may, if you don't remember, you may need to actually draw the Lewis dot structure for them before you can come up with the decision as to whether it is polar or nonpolar. We've gone through carbon dioxide. And because they, they do end up with polar bonds, they cancel each other out. And we only knew that because we had the Lewis dot structure to tell us that, okay? And so carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule. Therefore, the only force it has is the London dispersion force. Now, PF3, okay, it's in the same group, it's in groups of five. If you were to do the Lewis dot structure, it would end up looking like something like this. Oh, not nitrogen. And nitrogen brain, phosphorus and three fluorides. Okay. And moreover, it would have two lone pairs on the central atom, just like nitrogen did in, in the structure of ammonia. The fact that you got lone pairs on the central atom, you don't have to go any further you have a polar species, okay? Polar species. Because one would think that all these four, these lone pair and these bonds will all be tetrahedral and everybody will be all great and cancel out, but it's not. Because the lone pairs take up space, it causes this bond angle to be much less than 109.5 and therefore you, these polar bonds do not cancel each other out. All right, so we have a polar species now the next thing, okay, so it can't be London, so the process of elimination, okay? It can't be the London force, and obviously it can't be the ion dipole because there's no ion here, okay? It's covalent compounds. So you have two choices. It could be either dipole, dipole, or London bridges. Well, for it to be London bridge force, we need hydrogen. And guess what? There's no hydrogen here. So the only choice you have is London, excuse me, <laughs> dipole, dipole, not London, dipole, dipole force, okay? See how that worked through process of systematic approach of eliminating what it is or what it can't be, you come up to the logical conclusion of what it should be. HF, this one here, the fact that you see hydrogen, the fact that you see chloride involved, tells you two, two bits of information. One, it's polar, no question there, right? Two different elements. And second of all, with respect to the force, it's gotta be hydrogen bridging, okay? Remember, this is one of the three uh, options 
Yes, they have a dipole, but because it's hydrogen specifically bonded to fluoride, they have a force that's a little bit stronger than the dipole dipole in this hydrogen bridge. Remember, it is uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, fluoride. All right, so we have this hydrocarbon. You may not know what it is, but it tells you if you did the Lewis stock structure, you end up with a tetrahedral species, four carbon bonds, carbon hydrogen bonds. As I stated, the carbon hydrogen bonds are considered to be nonpolar. So you have all nonpolar bonds, you end up with nonpolar molecule, okay? All nonpolar bonds, nonpolar molecule. Polar bonds that do not cancel out, polar molecule. Polar bonds that do cancel out, nonpolar. And that might help. So being nonpolar, the only force involved there is the London force. And then finally, you get you get the Ki. You got potassium. You got iodide. That's an ionic compound, a metal and a nonmetal. So we have. It's an aqueous system, AQ, which is nothing more than water. Okay, So we have a salt in water. It's an ionic in polar water. And the only force involved here is an ion dipole. Has nothing to do with London dipole or hydrogen bridge. Okay. So now we have, we have a sign given the molecules. We have a sign specific intermolecular forces, because now we can do a compare and contrast. And just looking at these um, species, these chemicals, well, I can't compare uh, anything with respect to boiling point, melting point with the Ki. It's a totally different system, but I can with the rest of them, okay? And so with these ionic compounds, I can tell you that the ones with London forces will have the lowest boiling point than, say, HF, because HF has a strong, uh, with respect to their relative uh, strength within the three forces, hydrogen bridging is the stronger of the force. So hydrogen bridging will have, will have higher uh, boiling point, okay? And again, think about what's happening in the boiling point. When these molecules are attracted to each other tightly, it takes a lot of energy to break those apart. And I equate them to my infamous magnets, if I can get them out. Okay. And so uh, I have these four interactions that are occurring with these molecules in solution. And if, if the force is fairly strong, you know, the energy that it it absorbs is used to break up that interaction to break these molecules and go into, into the gas phase, okay? And so London forces, those forces are weak. So it doesn't take much to get them to evaporate. Whereas something like HF may take a little bit of high energy to get those molecules to separate from each other. And then dipole, dipole will be somewhere in the middle. So HF will have the higher boiling point, uh, the one carbon dioxide and methane would have the lower boiling point. And guess what? Carbon dioxide and CH4, methane, they're gases, okay? And generally because their forces are so weak, at, at 25 degrees, they exist as gases. At 25 degrees, doesn't water is a liquid, right? Because those molecules' forces are pretty strong and they hold each other tightly, and so they condense into a liquid at 25 degrees. All right. Um, this is a this is a a uh, law called Coulomb's law. There's there's not much to say about this. Okay, first of all, here's the equation. I don't worry too much about the k, the q1, the q2. That's q k is a constant. Okay. And Q1 and Q2 has to do with the charge. It could be a plus one or a negative one, whatever the case may be. What is interesting, what, the, what we want you to take away from this is that it's what's in the denominator. That is R, which represents the radius between two charges, okay, squared. 
And so what it says here is that the electrostatic attraction between two charges is proportional to the magnitude of the charge. It makes sense to think about it, magnitude, proportional. What that means when one variable goes up, the next goes up with it by the same magnitude or similar. It goes up, one goes up, the other goes up. So you can see where Q1 and Q2, everyone from a plus one to plus three, well, overall, that value gets bigger, right? Just simply because of the charge, okay? But, it also varies inversely proportional to the distance between them squared. Inversely proportional means basically if one variable goes up, the other one goes down, okay? And so to the radius square, uh, I think you got the, the gist of it if you think about this for a moment, is that if, if, uh, where's my thing? If I take this equation, okay, and I'm just going to say F. And what I'm going to do is just simply combine these variables. I'm just going to put them all together and just redefine them as X. Okay, so I'm not going to change. And the only thing that's going to change is my radius, and that's the distance between them. Okay, so scenario one, let's call radius R equals one. One centimeter, one unit of something. And so obviously, if I stick one in the denominator, one square is one, so my force after it, the distance of one unit is X, okay? Very straightforward. Now, let's do something more interesting here. Let's take the radius and we start it off at one, but let's simply do a simple thing and double that distance between these two charges. So we went to one unit, now we got two units apart, okay? And so now our equation becomes F is equal to X two square, right? And guess what that is? That is simply one fourth, two square, two, squ two squares is four. So it's one fourth of X. So our force by doubling, doubling our distance between it, our force, which was initially X, whatever value that is, now is reduced by a quarter of 25, 0.25, it gets smaller. And it makes sense, think about it. It's common sense here, think. I got two magnets that are holding on to each other, okay? Okay, I separate them. Now, far away, you don't feel much, but bring them in together and don't let them touch, but bring them in together and the closer I get in, that force gets stronger and stronger, right? Okay, and as I pull away, that force gets a little weaker. So it's fairly drastic. Well, let's go the other direction where we started with one. Now let's bring that one to R equals now 0.5, where we went from one, now you're at 0.5. So what we, in effect, we have brought it in half the distance where it was originally. And so if you go through this scenario again, guess what? F now is equal to four times X, okay? And so you can you can feel that even with if you put two magnets together and they're say north to north, you can feel that force as you bring them closer together. And the more closer together, the force is even greater. In this case, it increased by a factor of four if I decrease the charges by a factor of half. And it, it decreases by a factor of quarter if I double the distance between. Them. That's that's the main takeaway from this from this equation here. All right, so that's Coulomb's law. Quick review. All right, so now we have a table here, and uh, we need to answer some questions. Okay, the key to answering these questions is to make sure you're you are reading the question correctly, right? You're like, duh, Dr. Fred, but read it carefully because you got to discern whether you're talking about inter versus intra, okay? Inter versus intra. So first question says, what holds the atoms together in one ammonia molecule? And so 
They're talking about just one ammonia molecule. We don't care about what's going on around. So they must be talking about intra, the type of bond. And you're basically going to end up with a polar covalent bond. Okay. And that is what's holding the molecule together. Okay. What is holding the sodium ions in water? Okay, so we're talking about sodium ions and we're talking about in water. So that's the only choice here is the ion dipole force. Okay. That's what's holding all these ions and the and same is true for the chlorides if this was a salt, sodium chloride. Question number, next one, number four looks like. Saying, what is holding three HCl molecules together? So now we're talking about three of these molecules and what's holding them together, we're talking about intermolecular forces. So we have to assign a intermolecular force HCl obviously is polar, okay? It can't be London uh, bridging because it is it is hydrogen, but it's not bonded to NOF, it's bonded to chloride. So the only choice for this is a dipole, dipole forces, okay? Uh, what is holding the ions together in salt, sodium chloride? And here they must be talking about Solid, you're not talking, there's no aqueous involved here. So we're talking about sodium chloride in the solid form, and we know that sodium chloride is a ionic bond. Because it's a combination of metal and non-metal. Okay, what is holding four H2O molecules together? So obviously we're not talking about the bonding within in tra, we're talking about inter. All right, so now since it's inter, we have to de determine whether H2O is polar or nonpolar. And you know, water is very, very polar, okay? So that eliminates ion dipole because there's no ion dipole being, no ions involved here that eliminates uh, London dispersion forces because water is polar. Okay, so now you're left with either dipole dipole or hydrogen bridging. And obviously, yes, it has a dipole dipole. However, it also has hydrogen bonded to oxygen. And so in this scenario, water has hydrogen bridging force that holds three molecules together. Next question, what holds nitrogen gas molecules to each other? And so to each other tells us intermolecular forces. And so now we have to determine what are we, what kind of force is assigned to nitrogen gas? It's you got a triple bond here, lone pair. Two, nit two nitrogens means we have a polar, polar co uh, excuse me, covalent bond, but more importantly, it is a nonpolar because two of the same atoms. And the only force they have would be London forces. Uh, what holds the oxygen molecules, uh, oxygens together in an oxygen gas molecule? So we're talking about oxygen intramolecular forces. Okay, and so in this scenario, H2 is diatomic, no, uh, it is diat uh, diatomic, and it's nonpolar covalent bonds, right? Because they're talking about within the molecule itself, not with other molecules, which would have made it London forces, but we're talking about within the molecule. And then finally, what is holding two ammonia molecules together? which I wrote the structure up here in H3, okay? And that is obviously a dipole and it has nitrogen bonded to hydrogen, which is hydrogen bridging. All right, so of these molecules here, 
the ones with uh, hydrogen bridging would have the, the highest boiling point and the highest surface tension and the highest or lowest vapor pressure. You might think, what is vapor pressure? Well, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that here in a second. So now I can do compare and contrast with these, you know, which would have those who has the lowest or the highest property of the ones I just mentioned with respect to uh, surface tension, boiling point, so forth. All right. So this kind of puts it on the, in the flow chart. It's kind of skewed a little bit. I was having a challenge with the flow chart generator here. But, you know, we know we're dealing with covalent compounds, okay? If it's nonpolar, then the only force they deal with is the London dispersion force, okay? Now, if it's polar, we only, we have uh, three scenarios. It can be dipole-dipole, okay? Or it could be hydrogen bridging, but remember hydrogen bridging is only when you have hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, hydrogen bonded to oxygen, hydrogen bonded to fluoride. And when you have an ionic compound involved here, and it's, we're talking about an aqueous system, then we're dealing with the ion dipole, okay? So if it's not hydrogen bonded to these three elements, then the only force is the dipole dipole. And there's only three examples, okay? One, two, and three, where it could be hydrogen bridging. All right, so this brings us to these properties that we talked about. Vapor pressure, okay, uh, boiling point, and surface tension, and viscosity. Now, we're gonna be able to do a compare and contrast on these physical properties. We're not gonna be able to give you absolute values, but we're gonna be able to do who's lower, who's higher relative to each other. And we're gonna do that by going through the exercise we just did, is to assign whether it's polar or nonpolar, and then from there determine whether, uh, which force, London forces, dipole, or hydrogen bridging. If it's ionic and aqueous system, then we deal with ion dipole, okay? So let me, okay, let me, let me get something here for a second so I can talk about vapor pressure real quick. <laughs> One second. Now, when we talk about vapor pressure, uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about, we, we're familiar with this. I know you're familiar with this. I got a bottle here of water, okay? But let's assume for a moment that this was a soda pop. Oh, I'm getting a bad image here, what happened? There we go. All right, so I got the liquid sitting down here at the bottom. And then up in here in the airspace, Okay, I have buildup of, of molecules, gas molecules that have left the liquid and gone into this area up here where there's the airspace. If I was able to put a, a gauge on the, in the area that had, is up in the air here, I could measure the pressure. Okay, just like I can measure the pressure of your tire. Because up in here, we got gas molecules. So I can measure that pressure. And that is called the vapor pressure because it starts off as a liquid and it goes into the gas phase. And we have a lot of gas molecules in here. Obviously, the more gas molecules up here, the higher the vapor pressure. The less gas molecules up in the uh, dead space here, the lower the vapor pressure. So given what we've been talking about in the liquid, if those liquid molecules are held on to each other tightly, okay, 
is in that room temperature here, then their vapor pressure would be much less than a molecule, a compound who has a different intermolecular force, a weaker intermolecular force, meaning that their, their gas, their molecules can go into the vapor pressure at a lower temperature, maybe even a room temperature, okay? And so that's what we're talking about. So what, whatever force is strongest will hold their liquids in close, will hold the liquid stronger and keep them in the liquid phase, okay? And those molecules that hold their liquids weaker will have more of their molecules in the gas phase and that goes up, okay? As far as the vapor pressure. Okay, so, and we call this work here in the gas phase, obviously. Now, obviously, you know, if I were to take this bottle and take the cap off, it's going to eventually evaporate. You know, everything here, all liquids will eventually evaporate. And they do that because the molecules are constantly moving. And as they're moving, some of them are, are banging into the molecules that are on the surface. And they may transfer some of the uh, energy it has into those molecules on the surface, and there could be enough energy to kick them into the vapor phase, and, and eventually it would evaporate. Okay, you know you can take a, a, a cup of water and leave it on your countertop for about a week. You come back, that water's gone. Okay, you don't put any energy into it. Now, if you put the, put the lid on there, you know your pressure develops, your vapor pressure develops. So. <laughs> Strong IMF, okay, strong IMF forces will have a lower vapor pressure, okay, because that means that the strong forces hold on to the each other much stronger, much greater than those that have weaker IMF interactions. So it takes more energy to uh, drive those liquids out. For example, the diagram A and B here, the question may be asked, well, which one has the weaker IMF? What do you think? Which one has the weaker IMF, A or B? Anybody want to take a guess? A. A, exactly. A has the weaker because there's more gas molecules in the gas, in the gas phase, okay? And therefore, A has the, the weaker IMF, which tells us it has a vapor pressure, higher vapor pressure, simply because there's more molecules in the gas phase compared to B. Okay? So these interactions in here are much less than over here on B. Now, with respect to boiling point, well, the boiling point is that temperature in which a liquid goes from, from the gas, a uh, liquid phase to the gas phase. At that temperature, we call that the boiling point. So water has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius, for example. Now, using the same thought process we just did for surface uh, vapor pressure, we can do the boiling point, meaning that stronger, higher boiling point will come from those molecules that have a stronger IMF. Having a stronger IMF is going to take more energy to separate the molecules from each other. Okay. And then we have what's called surface tension. Uh, surface tension is, you know, why liquids, when you put them on the surface, they, they form drops or beads. It has to do with the surface tension of the liquid. Now, some, some have high surface tension, so they beat up quite a bit, and some have low surface tension, so that droplet on the, on the surface actually flattens out, okay? And so, like, for example, same reason again, a high surface tension is brought to you by 
those molecules that have a high IMF. Again, the molecules are being held on to each other tighter, okay? They're attracted to each other. And so therefore they will have something that looks, A, would have a higher surface tension because its IMF is stronger, causing that droplet to beat up more than say B, okay? Again, we're not we're not talking about absolute values. You know, if you need an absolute, you can look those up. But we're just doing a compare and contrast, and we're trying to explain why this happens from a standpoint of the intermolecular forces involved in in the in the uh, compounds and why some things have higher boiling points and some do not. Oil, for example, well, we can talk about viscosity. Viscosity is nothing more than a, it's a measure of the resistance of the liquid to flow, okay? And so oil flows slowly, it has a high viscosity, okay? And things like say vodka and alcohol, they, you know, they flow rapidly. That suggests they have a low viscosity, okay? And all these are temperature dependent. All these properties, uh, these properties temperature dependent because we know we can make oil flow faster by heating it up. And we can make vodka flow slower by cooling it down quite a bit, okay? And, and temperature does has a factor, but when we compare and compa contrast, we're talking about room temperature, right? So the stronger IMF has a, higher viscosity, again, for the same reasoning, the molecules want to be held on to each other at a greater, high, higher energy level. And therefore that hinders the, the, the flow and it goes slow, okay? So you may have a scenario as follows where it says, okay, we're going to compare ammonia and fluorine. It's a typical type of question, okay? Well, first thing we got to do is maybe we need to, you know, maybe it's the first time I've seen ammonia. I need to figure it out, what it is. And maybe you're given the uh, formula or given the name. And we've done ammonia quite a bit, but the ammonia has NH3 with nitrogen being the centralized atom. We can go to the Lewis dot structures and we end up with this particular structure and then recognize they get a long pairs in here. Yo, I got an apolar species, okay? And so now I can eliminate uh, 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 ion dipole. I can eliminate that, okay? I can eliminate that as far as IMF is concerned. I can eliminate uh, London dispersion forces, right? Because it is a polar species. And so what I got left over is dipole, dipole, or hydrogen bridging force. Okay. And so I think, well, it definitely has a definitely has a dipole dipole, but moreover, this is one of the examples of hydrogen bridging where you got NOF, hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, and fluor, uh, fluoride. I have that scenario, so that eliminates a dipole dipole. What I got here is H hydrogen bridging force, okay, assigned to ammonia. Fluorine, I know diatomic. So being diatomic, it's definitely nonpolar, okay? And being nonpolar, the only force it has is London dispersion forces, okay? And so I first have to assign the forces and make note of that. Give me one second, I'm having a little trouble here. There we go. There's our formulas. We got London bridging force. And excuse, I said London bridging force, I apologize. Hydrogen bridging force and London force. I'm trying to combine two forces here, right? Okay. Now, the strongest one here is hydrogen bridging force. Okay, that's, that's number one. And then London Bridge is the weakest. So now we can answer the questions. 
Question number one, which has the higher, stronger, the stronger IMF, well, I just answered that, ammonia, okay? Because it has hydrogen bridging force. And the question is, which has the lower boiling point, okay? Keep in mind, the one with the stronger IMF would have a higher boiling point. So the converse is true. That means that fluorine has the lower boiling point. And the question could have been the higher boiling points. You can word that question one or two ways. As this question, which one is nonpolar could have been the question. But here we went to this scenario. We know that uh, ammonia is the polar species. Okay. And then which one has the higher vapor pressure? Give us some thought. Think about that bottle and the gas molecules in the uh, gas phase. And more molecules in the gas phase increases the pressure. But to get more molecules in the gas phase means that in the liquid phase, it has to have weaker forces, right? So that would mean that fluorine would have the higher vapor pressure. And then which is the least viscous, okay? If it were a liquid, okay? And fluorine uh, would have the uh, least viscous because again, it has the weaker force. And then with respect to surface tension, ammonia would have the more surface tension. It would beat up more so than fluorine, okay? Because it has the higher, the stronger IMF. So quickly, as the IMF increases, the viscosity drops. The, excuse me, I, <laughs> the other way around. As the IMF increases, the viscosity gets greater because the molecules are being held to held on with each other with a stronger force. And the same is true for boiling point because now it takes more energy to break that force apart and their boiling point would be greater, okay? Their surface tension, similar, it would beat up more so than something else because again, the molecules are being held together much at a uh, stronger force. And because of that, in a closed container, that liquid would have a lower vapor pressure because there'd be less gas molecules going into the gas phase because the gas molecules are, are uh, not so much, not so much going into the gas phase. All right. <laughs> so we, we went one direction, but you know, think about this. If we reverse the question, then the answer is reverse, right? So questions like this could be answered, or questions could be given in any multiple ways, okay? So be aware of that. Uh, something special about water, uh, not, nothing much to say here, just a couple of things. Water has two, we went through Lewis that structure of water, it has two bonding electron pairs. And it has two non-bonding pairs. We went through that. It has a bent geometry, and that bond angle is much less than 109.5. Okay? Water is very polar, very polar, and it will dissolve many, many ionic compounds. Even the ones that are classified as ins insoluble, there are there is a small percentage of those molecules that will that will dissolve, uh, even though it's classified as insoluble. And, you know, obviously they will mix with other polar salts, okay? And has a very strong hydrogen bridging force between the molecules, very strong, okay? Some of the properties of water, uh, very polar, as I stated, very uh, high IMF, results in a lower, low vapor pressure and unusually high, you know, it's, you know 100 degrees Celsius, and melting point is zero degrees, okay? Has very high surface tension. And something unique about water is kind of, kind of not too many liquids, this happens to liquids, but liquids expand when they freeze, this crystal structures, they rearrange themselves, the water molecules and such that the total volume uh, of this area that it, it takes up increases. 
which results in uh, the density of ice, which is nothing but water, is much less than the density of liquid water, and hence ice floats. Okay. Some structures of uh, properties, uh, properties of water, some crystal structures. It's interesting that nature tends to use that hexagonal shape quite a bit. If you notice that there's a hexagonal shape in the crystals of water. And the picture to the right, I don't know this for a fact. And, you know, supposedly all these snowflakes, there, there's no two snowflakes that are similar, but I don't know. All right, so the heating of water. All right, if we were, well, we're going to use water quite a bit as an example, but if we were heating um, a liquid, and this is related to the intermolecular forces, okay? Obviously, on the far left, we start off, it's a solid, okay? And then we heat it up, start to heat it, and the temperature goes up. Until such time, guess what? We hit a plateau. Okay, and that plateau is at a specific specific temperature. Let me clear this up a little bit. So our, we start to heat something. We start off at whatever temperature, and it's a solid. We heat it up until such time that we hit a plateau, and we continue to add energy to it. You know, we, this is the axis. We're adding energy. And as we add more energy, that plateau remains the same. This could be temperature, let's say, zero degrees, okay, for example. Then there's a point where that plateau, we leave it, and the temperature is on the rise again. So we have a rise here, okay? Now, on the rise, that material is all solid on the first rise. On the second rise, that material is all liquid, okay? And then, guess what? We hit another plateau, okay? And this could be, you know, water again, 100 degrees Celsius. And we hit another plateau right here. Until such time, there's a sharp increase in temperature and that goes on. Now, in these rises, in this case, it's all gas phase. But at the rises, not the plateaus, the molecule is in the three different phases, solid, liquid, and gas. All right, so let's go through this. This one here. And we could say 100 degrees here. We can use zero degrees. So starting here, as I stated, as it rises, it's all solid, but on the plateau, we have a combination of solid going into liquid, okay? And then, as I mentioned earlier, once, once all of the solid has been converted to liquid, then we get a, a rise. And then we hit that second plateau. And at the second plateau, the liquid is being converted all to gas. When all of that liquid has been totally converted to gas, we get the next plateau, okay? All right, so what is happening at that plateau is the molecule, the energy that is being gained is used totally to, if this were, let's say, a molecule of water, that interaction between there at each plateau, but is be, all that energy that's being absorbed is being used to break up the intermolecular force, okay? To break up the intermolecular force to cause it to go from, in this case, the first factor from solid to liquid. And that temperature is constant. So a little tidbit, help you save some electricity. If you're heating something and it starts to boil, you know, some people have the idea, well, if I turn the heat up, the burner up a little bit more, I'm going to get it to boil any quicker or hotter. It won't get hotter. It's the same temperature. Stick a thermometer in there. You'll see it's going to boil 100 degrees or 212 Fahrenheit constant as the plateau. So once you got it boiling, turn that heat down. You're just wasting energy, wasting your money, throwing your money away. Okay. 
All right, so that is the heating curve in this case of water. And that, this is true for uh, most, a lot of compounds, okay? So that plateau is, is where the intramolecular forces are being used, are being broken by the heat and energy that's absorbed by the system. And so, oh. all right, so during the gas phase, temperature remains constant. All the energy, as I demonstrated on the graph, is used to break up the IMF. It's not breaking bonds, remember that. We're not breaking bonds. We don't have enough energy in there to break bonds. We're breaking the intermolecular forces, okay? Just you're 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 breaking when you heating your when you're boiling, melting, freezing, or condensing. Please don't say you're breaking bonds. And you're, there's no bond breaking here. What you're doing is you're breaking and or forming intermolecular forces okay. coming together. All right. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen. That is done from chapter 14. Let me mark. Well, thank you, Mercedes. I just saw that. Um, yeah. Um.